Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Play Expo in Blackpool. Now, my name is Dan Wood, and uh, we are from the Retro Hour podcast. Now, our podcast comes out every Friday. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, we do um, news and kind of recap the top stories of the week, and then every week in our show, we interview a veteran of the video games industry. And that is exactly what we're going to be doing on stage today. Now, we've got some huge names who are going to be joining us to tell their stories and, you know, relive those glory days of computing and video games. Just a quick show of hands. Did anybody here have a Commodore 64 back in the day? A few 64 fans. Any Amiga fans? I think we're in our element here, are we? <laughs> the right audience. <laughs> now, we'd like to introduce our first guest, of course. Former Ocean Software Director Gary Bracey. Now, Gary is widely regarded as turning the fortunes of Ocean Software and landing some of those huge movie license games that we all remember. So please, ladies and gentlemen, give a warm welcome to Gary. That's very warm. Thank you very much. Now, this is a question we always like to start with to give you a little bit of background. But what was your first ever computer experience then? When did it all begin? Um, well, it was in the days before computer porn, so my experience was uh, a little bit disappointing. Yeah, okay, just... <laughs> um, I guess the first real... I had an Acorn Atom um, with a floating point on, uh, so I was very lucky. Um, but my first real experience was uh, the Spectrum, I guess. Uh, and I got the, um, the box where you can get the, what was it, Teletext type thing? Mm -hmm. Press yeah. Um So that was online as well. Um, and that sort of got me into it, and I thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. Uh, did you always kind of want to work with technology, or did you have other ambitions? Um, I, had, I had ambitions. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I worked in retail, I worked at Littlewoods chain stores, uh, management, and uh, getting, getting into computer games sort of changed my life, and I thought, well, this could be an interesting uh, direction. Uh, career-wise, so uh, I bought a Spectrum uh, the day the Spectrum came out and I rented some shelves in a local video library and bought a few games uh, from a distributor and thought I'll start a retail operation and within a year, it did pretty well, within a year I made enough money to open up my own short store in uh, a place called Allerton Road in Liverpool, which was the first computer shop in Liverpool and um, that sort of got me on my way. The shop was called Blue Chip, very imaginative. Um, and, and it was great, and, and I was dealing with people who were really into games. It was in the very, very early days. Um, and then, about two years into it, I wasn't really cut out to be a shopkeeper. Um, and John Woods, who was a mate, and he relatively recently started uh, a company called Spectrum Games, which was, had turned into Ocean Games, I think it was then, Ocean Games. Uh, and he asked me if I um, had any experience with games, and I said, yes, I sell them. I think I know what people like. And he asked me if I wanted to help him oversee uh, the game production of the company, which was doing quite well at the time. They, 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 they'd done a few, uh, a few successful games. Um, so I had no grasp of programming. Uh, I can't draw, I um, mean, can't. Uh, I'm not an artist. But I, I, I think I had a feel of what people liked to play because I sold them to them every day. Um, and that's what really kicked it off. So I joined Ocean and uh, I think I found a niche. That was in 1985 when you joined Ocean? Uh, yeah, around about that. And that must have been quite an interesting time because, you know, obviously before that we had the fall of Imagine Software as well. That obviously was like a huge story in the industry then. I mean, did that kind of affect Ocean? Obviously, a lot of their games kind of came out of that purchase, didn't it? Yeah, I, well, they bought the brand. I mean, I knew all the Imagine Boys. I used to, um, I mean, we socialised a lot because the, the, the hub of the UK games industry at the time was really Liverpool and Manchester. And in Liverpool, you had Bug Buy, you had Imagine, uh, Software Projects, um, and Odin, which became Thor, which became Odin, uh, and quite a few of them. So um, it was quite a big, big industry in uh, in the northwest there. Um, so I knew quite a few people there. Um, and when Imagine went, uh, which was sad, uh, Ocean acquired the brand and decided to publish their coin-op games, their coin-op conversions uh, under the Imagine label. Well, had you um, always been a kind of movie fan as well? Big star. Yeah. 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 Uh, in fact, I always thought, if, if I hadn't have done this, if all opportunities had been open, I would have loved to have gone to film directing. That was my dream. 
Um, but instead of sort of, I guess I was directing games, which is close enough, I guess. Um, but I love movies, and uh, when Ocean Star, when I started getting into the Ocean licensing side, um, after the, f the early successes of a few games, uh, particularly Top Gun, um, the movie companies started to realise that this video game hoo-ha uh, could actually be quite lucrative because they started seeing royalty checks which they'd never seen before. They'd licensed the game for X thousand dollars and wouldn't expect anything more from it. But all of a sudden, some of these games started to sell quite a few uh, and they started to get royalty checks in and they started to take it really seriously. So, um, and, and at the time, I guess Ocean were the largest active company in, in movie licenses. So they started sending us scripts. Um, and I think I was the only one who wanted to read the script. How we devoured these things. I read all the scripts and I actually still kept a few. They're all at home. Um, and so I was looking at the scripts and sort of saying, yeah, there's potential there. No, that's not suitable. They actually sent us, I swear to God, they sent us Rain Man. Was. Uh, perfect for the video. <laughs> Count how many matches on the floor. Um, um, uh, so that's what sort of sparked that off. And of course, uh, I got this sort of B movie script, um, which I read, and I thought it was it was pretty good. And uh, I said uh, I said to John David that uh, we ought to take this one, and that was Robocop. And uh, that was uh, a big one because no one. Had, no one really expected that to do as well as it did. Um, it was a B-movie after all, or perceived to be a B-movie, and it just captured the culture at the time. And of course it was perfect fodder for a video game. It was, the genre was perfect, uh, the action element, and uh, Paul Van Hoven, is that his name? I forget now. Um, he, was, he was a pretty good established director. So um, it was a bit of a punt, but um, uh, it really, really, changed the fortunes of Ocean in that it became, uh, it gave uh, movie licensed games a lot more credibility. Whereas before they were a little bit more, I guess, cookie cutter. Cook, cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. Well, when you first started at Ocean, I mean, was it kind of one of your priorities to exercise a bit more quality control? Uh, I didn't start Ocean. I started Yeah, yeah it, there was no specific agenda. What had happened was, when I was brought in, uh, Ocean had uh, recently got the rights to Knight Rider and Street Hawk, and they were being developed by some freelance companies. One of them was in Brighton, I recall. Um, and I went to visit them, and they'd just been taking the money and hadn't been, really been doing anything with the, uh, with the game. And we had a deadline, and the marketing was all set to launch the game in three months' time or whatever it was. And uh, there was no one overseeing it and uh, so I felt that the only way really to address this was to have a little bit more control so bring more people in house because when I joined I think there were about 10 maybe 12 people uh, in house at Ocean so the first thing I wanted to do was expand that into a proper studio and bear in mind this was not done in those days these days you've got studios of hundreds and hundreds of people, but in those days it didn't exist, it was the start of the industry and no one knew what to do. So um, we started a recruitment campaign and um, we started getting some amazing talent in, some of whom are here today, um, and bringing the, the real AAA titles in-house, which allowed us, I use the control in the nicest sense of the word, but control in that uh, we knew where it was at the time, we knew whether it was slipping behind or going to be on, on, on time. Uh, if it wasn't looking good, we could tweak a few graphics. And um, uh, it worked. Yeah. What was the uh, kind of culture like back then? Was it a laid back place or what kind of suits? And... It was insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I was about, I was about 30, 29, 30, most of the developers were in their teens, in their late teens. Um, and as I say, all incredibly talented uh, and enthusiastic and passionate. Um, and so, but no, most of them had come straight from school or college or whatever and hadn't had a real job before. 
Um, so you have the suits upstairs who are doing the sales and the marketing, and then you have the t-shirts downstairs in the dungeons, as we call them, um, and, and they were developing the games. And I was sort of in the middle, I, I, I was the interface between the two. Um, so uh, the suits would scream at me if something was late or something wasn't quite right or wasn't getting a good review. And uh, the t-shirts would scream at me because I was screaming at them saying it's late and hasn't got a good review. So uh, I was completely unpopular. Um, but anyway, no, it was a great job. And um, uh, it was the culture, how can I describe it? It was, it was just raw. It was, it was a pioneering time where the video games industry was just start, starting to exist. There was no precedent. You couldn't, you couldn't look at another company and say, that's what we want to be like. Um, uh, th there were no examples to follow. Uh, we made it up as we went along, I guess. And uh, some of it we did, we did well. Some of it we didn't do so well. But uh, I think we did more well than we did badly. Uh, and it, it was wonderful. The atmosphere was great because everyone loved what they were doing. Um, and no one really considered it to be something that was going to be, become part of the global culture. In those days, it was a fad. It was going to last five years and then people would move on from video games to something else. And no one believed that in, in 30 years' time we'd be coming to event, an event like this and seeing all that old stuff and, and, and so much affection being shown for it. Um, I, I think that's taken us all by surprise, and if anyone says any different, uh, I, I'd, uh, I'd disagree. But um, no, we just didn't know. We were just doing something that we loved, and, and that showed, and it showed in the, in, in the whole culture. I mean, speaking about the culture at Ocean, I mean, did you kind of learn any lessons from Imagine Software? Because I know a lot of us probably saw that documentary that went on TV, and it was lots of, you know, extravagance, you could say, and yeah. like 18 year olds driving like new Ferraris and that kind of thing. I mean, did you guys live it up quite a lot or did you look at them and think actually we should grow it in a bit? Um, no, that there was never that, that lack of control. I think, I think Ocean was, was basically run by uh, John Woods and David Ward. Um, and they were businessmen. They, and they actually just saw Ocean as a business. They weren't into games. I don't think they ever played a game in their lives. Um, they saw it as a business opportunity, and so commercially they ran it as a company. Um, downstairs in the dungeons was a little bit different, a little less disciplined, but upstairs, as I say, you had the suit, you had professional salespeople, you had marketing teams, artwork, art teams, um, interfacing with the likes of Bob Wakeman, who's here today, um, to do the artwork, and, 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 and created this great um, business. Uh, and I guess they actually created a template for the way business was run uh, in the video games area. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't out of control, although uh, I think David would have liked a Ferrari. Well, he had one, actually. But, uh, um, uh, no, it was, it was, I think everyone was doing pretty well. Um, everyone was, was pretty well paid because we wanted to keep the talent. Uh, so we needed to incentivize everyone. So everyone had a pretty good, a pretty good life. Um, what was your relationship with Commodore like, and how did you work with it? Um, it was very platonic. <laughs> um, the, the, the relationship with Commodore, um, I mean, David Pleasance is, is here today, and I haven't seen him literally <laughs> since those days. But it's going to be quite a reunion. Um, we had a good relationship with, with Commodore. I was probably less involved because that was on the sales side. So obviously, um, we were developing and creating and publishing some very, very popular games on a global scale. Uh, and Commodore were releasing new, new, new uh, platforms, new hardware. Uh, so they wanted some way to push that hardware, and obviously a great way of doing that was bundling the machines with, um, with high-profile games. And of course, we did the Batman, uh, the Batman bundle for the Amiga, which was a phenomenal success. Um, and part of that, I would like to think, was attributable to the game being, uh, being pretty good. Let's talk about licensing games, because um, I imagine it's quite an interesting process. Did you have much involvement with the movie studios? Did you kind of get scripts and ever visit the sets? And All the time. I spent um, probably two weeks out of every six in, uh, 
in Hollywood, hey, um, had to buy sunglasses now. Um, and, and that was, that was a, a, an amazing experience. I was on the sets an awful lot and I made friends with, I'll never forget, this sounds awful now, but um, uh, one of the movie stars of the day was back then, Alec Baldwin, who was married to Kim Basinger. And they were like the Brad and Angelina of the day. And um, he was doing uh, The Shadow, uh, being directed by Russell Mulcahy, who did Highlander. And uh, we got a license for that. And I had quite a few meetings with them, and uh, I, I got quite friendly with Alec Baldwin, of all people. And I remember inviting him to my house for dinner. I said, oh, you and Kim come around for dinner. And he, oh, yeah, great. When we're in London next, you'll come over. Uh, he never did. <laughs> um, we still got the plate out and the plate set up. Um, um, but uh, yeah, it was it was great. We'd go to the uh, the premieres, uh, the premiere parties of the, the movies. I mean, it really was. It was a, it was a wonderful experience, and probably the the best experience of all. Um, I'm, I'm name dropping because you asked the question, but uh, it's a nice little anecdote. Is um, uh, meeting with Steven Spielberg at, on uh, Jurassic Park, uh, and he wanted a creative meeting, so I went into his office in um, Amblin Studios, which was on the Universal lot. And uh, we had a great, and he was a lovely guy, he was like a kid, he was like a big kid, full of enthusiasm, and can we do this, and can we do that? Um, but the thing that re I remember most about his office was um, he had this, this cartoon, and the year that E.T. came out, Gandhi came out that same year, and he had this wonderful cartoon on the wall where there's a picture of Gandhi with a wheelbarrow, full of Oscars, and next to him is a picture of E.T. with a wheelbarrow full of dollar bills. And it's just, it's just um, That's the thing I remember most about my meeting with Steve Spielberg. Um, so, no, it was, it, the, the movie licensing side was great. The scripts were kept coming in, and uh, we'd visit the studios, we'd speak with the directors, and sometimes they'd have ideas of what they wanted the game to be, which we never, we never delivered, and uh, we did our own thing. Um, of course, the, the problem was, you know, we got these things and the movie was coming out in 12 months, and, or even six months in some cases, so we had to design and develop and uh, uh, get the game out in time for the movie release, which, which was quite challenging, even more challenging these days. Um, but as I say, we had, I, I can't stress this enough, we had exceptional talent in our studio, and, and I've been asked about this a number of times, and people have asked me about particular people, and I hate mentioning names because I don't want to miss anyone out, but we were, or I was blessed with some incredible people, um, and, and they were great, and they delivered. When you got a movie license, would there be a lot of competition from the internal staff to actually get a job working on that? Um, yeah, I think so. It, it, it wasn't quite that easy because obviously um, everyone was working on a, a project and then when they finished, they'd look at the next one. So it was a question of timing, really. It, it's all very well someone saying, I want to work on Jurassic Park. But if they're in the middle of the current project, then they wouldn't be able to, but maybe they'd be brought in afterwards to help uh, to help the scheduling a little bit. Um, <coughs> but yeah, it, was, it wasn't entirely a democracy in that way, but obviously... Um, from my perspective, if someone was genuinely interested in the property, then I think that that would probably turn out to be a better game because they were passionate about it. Were there ever any licenses you were offered that you turned down that went on to be like massive movies? Mark Rain from Epic Games, um, he runs Epic Games. He keeps reminding me, and I, I swear to God I don't remember this, but he keeps reminding me that I turned down Wolfenstein. Uh, <laughs> um, and he, he gloats about that all the time. I genuinely don't remember it. Um, in terms of movies, no, there were some we lost which we wanted, like The Simpsons and The Turtles. Um, the one movie license that sticks out in my mind that we shouldn't have got was Hudson Hawk, um, <laughs> which was an absolute turkey. But if I tell you, that was the best script I'd ever read. And you had a great director, uh, Shane Black was the writer, uh, I forgot who the director was, but uh, you know, significant director. Bruce Willis was Flavor of the Month. Um, wonderful, wonderful script. It was funny, it was action packed, it was great, and it was ideal for a video game. I thought, this, this is going to be huge. Um, 
what had happened apparently at the time was Mr. Willis was such an ego that uh, he'd come on set and he'd basically rewritten the script for that day. And so the script that we bought was very, very different to the script that ended up on screen, um, which is such a shame because it would have made a great movie, the original. So not a regret, but maybe a mistake. Um, there were such big kind of license games. Did you ever have any issues with submitting to them, them to the game company and them saying, oh, no? Yeah, um, there was Batman's ears were one pixel too long. I remember in um, uh, John Rickman's Batman game, um, you it was an isometric 3D, 3D game, and you popped along and, and you had to get your life recharged by taking pills. Batman does not take drugs. So we had to change that whole, uh, that whole scenario. Um, we, we were rushing to get The Simpsons. Uh, Acclaim got the license for The Simpsons, uh, but we got the Spectrum and maybe C64 license, I think, uh, for Europe. Um, so we had to do certainly the Spectrum version, maybe the 64 as well. And uh, we submitted the game, and, and we were doing it by the skin of our teeth. It had to be out. For Christmas. In fact, I think it may have been part of the Commodore bundle at the time. So it really was a very, very strict deadline. And we got the thing back saying, everything is approved except Bart's blink is off model. So, uh, firstly, I didn't know what off model meant, but it just meant it wasn't approved. Um, because the Simpsons, apparently, learned this because of it, um, when, they bl when you blink, um, your top eyelid goes down to the bottom, like most human beings. The Simpsons blink differently. They have a bottom and a top eyelid that meet in the middle. And our blinks were, um, were off model because we did it as a human blink. It's probably that man over there, Mark Jones, he probably did <laughs> blame him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so um, that, was, that was a silly approval. But uh, no, it was, it was mostly uh, likeness, <coughs> likenesses that gave us problems with approval. Well, obviously, you mentioned Batman. I mean, you know, in 1989, that got a massive reinvention with the Tim Burton movie. Before that, I mean, it was kind of remembered as a bit of a knack kind of 1960s show. Obviously, in that process of licensing the game, did you have any idea just how popular that was going to go on to be? Uh, I don't think so. I, I think I would put it down to the... I mean, the whole point of, of Ocean, uh, the philosophy of getting <coughs> licenses, uh, was not necessarily that we have to, we have to make a, a game based on that property. It was a marketing thing. Um, what we used to call the granny purchase, because granny would go out at Christmas and bu want to buy her grandson uh, a, a computer game. So she'd go to the shop and she'd see a vast array of cassettes or discs on the shelf and not have the faintest idea what to get him. But then she'd see Rambo and Top Gun and Batman and she'd recognise those, so she'd buy them. So it was, it was, sounds very cynical, but um, it, was, it was purely a marketing exercise. So when we got Batman, it was a recognisable brand. Um, but also, uh, I, I mean, I believe we all thought it would do incredibly well because the game was fantastic. John Rickman did, did an amazing game. And then when the movie came along, uh, we knew that was going to be a big hit movie. And, uh, and I think we did the movie justice with the game we made. Uh, did you ever kind of feel under pressure having to, you know, put big financial commitments into these games and, and maybe have to change things? Um, I didn't buy any financial commitments. No. <laughs> uh, yes, there was, there was significant pressure. I mean, when we got to uh, Jurassic Park, I think that was the first $1 million license. And this was back in the days when a $1 million was a lot of money. Um, uh, it, was, it was the first $1 million license. And back in the, the late 80s, maybe 1990, um, that was a punt because there was never any guarantee that a movie was going to be successful. You, you, you had the credentials, you may have had Steven Spielberg directing what was the biggest book property of, of, of the decade, but there was no guarantee it was going to be, uh, it was going to be a success. So, you know, we ponied up a million dollars and probably had to pay quite a large royalty as well, I don't remember. So there was a lot of pressure and I remember um, wanting to do something groundbreaking for it. And the idea was to do a Doom-type game in 3D. Uh, uh, but we, we just didn't have the time because, again, you know, we had a year or six months to do this game. Uh, and, and so you couldn't do anything too technologically advanced because it would take too long. 
And so we had to make compromises, sadly. You know, back in that kind of like 8-bit, 16-bit era, a lot of the games were platformers. Was it ever kind of a challenge to get the spirit of the original movie into a platformer? Yeah, um, that was always... I mean, I mean, one way we addressed it, I think, was to do a number of mini-games around the, the platformers. So, for Batman the movie, movie, for instance, the main substance of the game was a platform game, but then there'd be other intermediate levels that would give some variety and, and, and obviously lift it. And, of course, the look of the game was very important, so we had to use uh, uh, reference from the movie uh, to try and replicate the look and the feel of, of, of the movie within the game. Uh, we did the same with Robocop, we had some mini games in that, but <coughs> platformers were tried and tested, although um, personally, uh, I believe the best platformer we made in-house was Adam's Family. Uh, I just thought it was remarkable. Well, you're one of the few companies that released um, stuff for the Commodore C64C, uh, well, the 64C and the Amstrad GX4000 as well. Uh, could you tell us more about those systems? Absolutely not. I have no <laughs> record. Um, I'd love to. I honestly don't. I mean, I don't remember. I, I, there are some things I remember very, very well. I don't recall an awful lot of that. It was the C64C with the cartridge? Yeah, it was console, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I genuinely don't re remember anything about that. I'm sorry. Probably that's begun to be there. <laughs> Probably, yes. No, I'm not being cagey. I'll happily answer everything honestly if I remember. Uh, I don't remember. Well, speaking of The Simpsons as well, I mean, obviously, that was just shown on Sky at the time, wasn't it? And then. Bart Simpson became like the biggest star in the world. And that again showed quite a lot of foresight on Ocean's behalf. I mean, did you kind of have people keeping an eye on what was going to be the next trend? Were you always looking ahead? Well, it, it, it's funny you mention The Simpsons because I remember I was out in the States the week the first Simpsons show uh, was shown. Uh, it, it, it had been originally a little bit on the Tracy Ullman show, and it was the first week that it, 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 it had its own uh, episode of its own series. And I came back and I said, we've got to get this license. This is going to be huge. The Americans are going mad about it. Uh, we ought to get the license. And no one had heard about it in the UK. So um, there wasn't the attention paid to it. And about a year later, when it started to become, to become truly phenomenal, uh, a claim snapped, that snapped it up already. Uh, so that's what we missed, actually. I remember the first Simpsons at school, we had a, a VHS copy from America and a full assembly and we all sat and watched it. Comments um, like that made me feel so old. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of uh, kind of other franchises, you worked on a game based on the Watchmen comics as well. How was that? Um, yeah, I, again, I was, into, I was into comics a lot. And uh, the Watchmen had just started. In fact, it, it hadn't completed the series and I, I loved it. Um, so I got in touch. We were doing a little bit with DC because of the relationship with Batman. And um, I contacted DC, we went up to New York, <coughs> excuse me, and we were looking at a few licenses, including Lobo. Um, and the Watchmen, they asked them if the Watchmen rights were available, and they said yes. So we negotiated those, and then I got in touch with Dave Gibbons, uh, who was the artist on the Watchmen, which he uh, co-created with F. Alan Moore, excuse me. And um, he came to the, um, to the studios, and that was in the old ones in Central Street, and we gave him his first computer, an Amiga, and he was actually going to do the graphics for the game as well, or help with the graphics. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but I don't know what happened to it. Um, for some reason, I think maybe it didn't become mainstream enough. This was obviously before the movie, um, a long time before the movie. Uh, and perhaps it, it didn't become mainstream enough. And uh, although we were a big company, we did have limited resources, and we had to cherry pick what we'd apply those resources to. And so I think, uh, I don't think we ever actually prototyped the game. I don't think so, no recall. Well, speaking of comics, I mean, you mentioned you were a comic fan then. Was there any other, like, superheroes or comics that you would have liked to make a game of? I did want to do Lobo. I okay. really wanted to make an adult version of Lobo, um, but I was voted down on that. Although I think we did play around with the idea at Ocean US at one point. Um, but no, it was always very difficult. And, and this was the thing about, you know, you obviously think the big one always was Superman. He was the biggest superhero. But when you think about it, how can you make a game 
um, to control someone with all those different powers. He's got X-ray vision, heat vision, he can fly, he's got super strength, all the rest of it. Um, and your controls will be all over the place. It will be an incredibly complicated game to, to develop. Um, so we didn't really consider that. Uh, I, I don't remember, I'm sure there were, I think Green Lantern was one we, uh, we tried to do as well. But uh, I don't remember any of those, I'm afraid. Sorry. So, why did you end up leaving Ocean in the end? Pass. Um, <laughs> uh, I... Yeah. It was being bought by uh, a French company. Um, uh, <laughs> well, there was rumours of it being bought by a French company. And uh, I felt that the culture was going to change a little bit. And I wanted to move on. There was more to it. <laughs> For another day. Yeah, another day. So what it's not say? being recorded. <laughs> I'll ask you later. <laughs> so what would you say is kind of Ocean's legacy then? Um, I, I, it's a great legacy. I mean, you, it, the, the number of people here are a testament to that legacy. Um, I, I think we were there at the beginning. We did a number of things right. I think it was one of the few companies in the business that was operated as a business. Uh, and that contributed greatly to its success. Um, I'd like to think that um, we, we set out a template for the way game, and not just us, but a lot of companies in, in, in those day, days, um, we set out a template for the way games would be developed from there on. Um, you know, there was no such thing as a producer when I started at Ocean. There was, and then they started talking, that came from America, oh, you've got a producer. And what the hell is a producer? We've just got people looking after the games. That's what they had on their business card, a person who looks after the games. Um, uh, so, so the titles became very Americanized, but the, the actual process, I think, um, is still largely kept to today. You know, you, you schedule things, you design them out, you develop them, really simplify it. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's an inexact science. Uh, and this is the problem. With a movie, with a book, you have a very, very finite template to follow. If you're making a movie, you can have a shooting schedule, and weather permitting, you can pretty much stick to it and edit it. You allow time for editing, and you'll get end up with a pretty good experience, and you know time-wise what that's going to be. With a video game, it's really difficult to explain to people back then, because most people didn't play games. Um, and the movie people, you had to explain to them, this was not a linear experience. You were um, creating this infinite form of entertainment which could branch off in any way. And everything had to be tested um, for usability, interface, look, feel. Um, and you wanted to people to get their five pounds worth uh, when they bought their cassette. Um, so it, it, was a, it was a really, really complicated process, and therefore you needed, the people developing the games had to be gamers. They had to understand what they were playing and, and whether they enjoyed the experience themselves. Um, and that has obviously continued to today, and as I say, Ocean were no, uh, weren't the only ones doing that. There was uh, well, Bob Kells over there, System 3, and, and, and plenty of others, you know, making amazing games. And, and, and all of those companies, I'd like to think, back in those days, formed the template for the way things are done today. Well, uh, talking of today, are you still in the games industry? Yes, uh, for my sins. Um, yes, I, I, um, I, I started a company called Scary Puppies, and uh, I'm just helping out, uh, trying to find new studios who have great talent and a great idea and helping them uh, raise money and uh, find publishers. And I'm um, doing a little bit in China as well. I love the business. It, it, it's been the most incredible business. And it's changed a lot. It's very volatile. Mm -hmm. And it's very frustrating. Um, but I can't think of anything better uh, I'd like to do. And I, I do consider myself very lucky. Really. What is it that excites you so much and keeps you passionate <coughs> about the games industry? Um, because it's constantly changing and it's the innovation, because the true innovation is coming from the younger generation. You'll find that, uh, I'm being cynical now, sounding a bit like Simon Butler, um, that, that there's a lot of iteration in the AAA games. It's the very, very similar scenarios because when you're looking at multi-million dollar budgets, they've got to play it safe. 
Um, so they don't want to take too much of a risk on massive innovation. With exceptions, there are exceptions, but by and large, um, games are, are changing very, very little. But the real changes are coming from the indies, are coming from the, the, the small bedroom programmers, reverted back to the 80s in that regard, um, who, who've got no overheads and all they want to do is <coughs> make great games. And there are some truly remarkable ideas coming from them. Well, thank you so much, Gary. We're going to do a Q&A with the yeah, audience. I thought was sure a Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we have lots of Ocean fans in the audience here. Anyone would like to ask a question? Raise your hand. Um, as a kid growing up, I loved The Simpsons and I loved wrestling. And I was always wanting those arcade games to come out on their work platform, C64 Amiga, but I was going when they didn't. I was just wondering, was there any problem with them licenses, or were they ever, ever offered to Ocean, or were they just un unobtainable? No, it, it was funny, with uh, with coin-ops, the rights were different. The coin-op companies would license the coin-op rights, and we'd license the video game rights. Sometimes, as in the case of Robocop, we'd get everything. We'd have the coin-op, the computer game, and actually the pinball. Um, so we were in control of that, and so the game you saw on the computer was the same. Excuse me, it's the coin up. Um, but by and large, the company, I think it was Bally, who licensed uh, The Simpsons on coin up, uh, they'd design it and develop it themselves. I, I, did did the coin up game not get released got, at any I point? It, it got released on C64 in like Australia or somewhere like that. Oh, I, really? don't know, I don't know who did the convert, I can't remember who did the conversion, yeah. but it wasn't. Well, it was Bally who would have licensed that out, sub-licensed it, actually, but that would have been complicated because they wouldn't have had the video game rights, so it would have had to have been a collaboration. And the problem is, um, with something like a big license like The Simpsons, uh, we would have to pay a fair a chunk of royalty to uh, Macroni or Fox uh, for the license. If you're also going to use the game from Bally as well, you'd have to pay them an additional royalty on top, and then it may not become commercially viable. Right. Yeah. Anybody else got a question? Yeah. Yeah. The game assets, uh, you know, like sound and graphics and music. Were there any examples where you might have outsourced that? Was it all done in house? Did you do everything within Ocean? Um, we, we try to do, as I say, the, the really, really top games, the, the high profile games, we, we tended to keep in house. Um, you know, our, our musicians, we have an amazing music department and the likes of John Dunn and Barry Leach and Martin Galway and all the rest of them. And again, I don't like mentioning game names because they always leave out. So um, they were remarkable, and, and obviously they could do more than one game at a time. Um, so. Yeah, we, we generally try to keep it as much in-house as possible. And in fact, I think we probably, because we did outsource some games, we didn't do everything in-house. Uh, and of course, there were a lot of original games from the likes of John Rittman, Sensible Software, DID, and they'd have their own resources. Um, but sometimes our own musicians would write the music and video for uh, uh, external games. Um, I don't know whether they did John Rittman's, they may have done John Rittman's stuff. And Martin Galway did sensible software, uh, products, I think. Mr. Driscoll had a question. Oh, oh no, I didn't. But, um, <laughs> so, how, with when you went from sort of sixteen bit to thirty two at the tail end of Ocean, can you sort of elaborate on that a little bit further? Just because I imagine it was quite difficult the changing industry. The, 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 there were two marked changes. One was going from eight bit to sixteen bit, obviously, yeah. and having to develop games that would fit into 16K of memory to games that would fit into a massive, uh, I can't remember, one megabyte or whatever it was, 512 <coughs> But then um, the, the, the change from 16-bit um, to 32-bit wasn't so remarkable as the, the change from computer to console, because of course the Sega and the Nintendo started to get, get a game a lot of ground, and the culture of developing Console games was very, very different indeed. So that was probably a big, a big, a bigger change, and uh, took a while to adapt. But we did it. <laughs> Anybody else? You're right. Um, you mentioned before when you've got people down the dungeon having uh, moaning at you and things like that. 
Do you remember what your relationship was though with, um, you know, for different magazines, uh, you know, in regards to reviewing games, do you have any run-ins or anything like that, going back was a bit too harsh or um, anything? Yeah, I, I mean, I had a great relationship with the magazines because of the nature of what I did. The, the, the sales and marketing people were extremely good at what they did, but again, they didn't play the games an awful lot. So when they wanted a game demo, Quite often, I'd go and help them demo the game as well. Um, and so I built up a, a, a great rapport with, with a lot of the old Crash guys, Gary Penn, who saw last week, and uh, Julian Rignall, and the rest of them. Um, but we had a pretty good relationship. Um, there was a little bit of, of aggravation, because if we got a really low review score, um, that hurt, obviously, and, and it hurt, you know, our guys, our developers took it very personally as well. They'd invested six months, 24 hours a day into, into putting this game together. It was more often than not a labour of love, and then for someone to say, it's a load of shit, and give it 20%. <laughs> uh, that's going to hurt, you know, you, you've invested a part of your life into that, but that's the business. I, my, my whole thing was, we spent a fortune on these magazines buying advertising. So we could, you know, if one month we've, we've got a £5,000 worth of advertising for a particular game in a magazine and they've given it a 20% review score, it sort of offsets that investment we've made. So that was a little bit, I'm not saying they shouldn't give it a bad <laughs> review score, um, but you can understand they're happy to take the money. But if they could tell us, well, look, we're going to give it a bad review score, there's not really much point in you advertising in this magazine. It's probably quite fair, but we never got that. Did they give you any feedback? Sorry. <laughs> it was always too late. I yeah. mean, they'd always give us feedback, and, and they'd always tip, a, tip us off or tip me off and say, it's not very good, or it's great, or whatever. Um, and sometimes we'd be able to persuade them and sway them because they're a little on the fence about something. But bear in mind, when the review, uh, when, when the magazine companies got the review copies, it was too late to change anything. We were going to be releasing it next week. So, you know, whatever feedback they gave us, we couldn't really, it's not like today where you can change something on the fly. That was it, it was cast in stone. Thank you. People <laughs> forget back then, we need a read that magazine reviews could make a break again. <laughs> Well, they did, yes, yes. Um, but, Sound yeah. like a robot, Dan. Anybody else? Did someone get the door? <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you have a lot of enjoyment uh, when you were running your own computer store? And also, did you have any you know, young customers that come in that were able to be quite a talent in the industry? Yeah, um, it, I loved it. I, I mean, it was great uh, because because when I wasn't busy, I could play computer games all day. It's fantastic. Um, no, I, I really enjoyed it for the short amount of time I had it, but I wasn't really a shopkeeper, as I say. And it's great when I was busy, but of course you get periods when no one's in, and it, okay, I was playing games, but uh, it wasn't, you felt as though you needed to be doing something else. Um, but it was, again, it was, it, was, it was a bit of a first in Liverpool, and, uh, and I still get... Facebook messages from people who I haven't heard from for probably almost 40 years, maybe 35 years, saying, I used to come into your shop and, you know, you got me into games. And, and it, it's really, really gratifying. Like, like people here today, you know, that there's enormous affection for those days. And, and we had no idea that would happen. We were just doing these things because we enjoyed them. Um, we were doing them as much for ourselves as for you, uh, and, and it's lovely to see so many people at an event like this um, paying homage to those days. Any more questions for Gary? The front rally? Don't much in that, that McDonald's breakfast day. Uh, <laughs> <I'll just laughs> Gary, do you have any um, cool gaming or film memorabilia like in your home or collection? Mm, do you know, um, I, I kept... Um, and I don't know what happened to it, I must have lost it when I moved house. I kept a head over heels plushie. And it was um, these, these plushies that were made for a com competition prize with Crash or something. And it was like a big head and a big heels with a bit of Velcro on the top and bottom so they'd stick together. Um, and I had those and they were wonderful. And I lost them. Um, I, I've still got uh, quite a few scripts. Um, but the problem with Ocean, um, we never had a library, we never had a showcase, a museum section with a cassette, a box of every single game, 
No one did that. And I know Mark over there has been made it his life's <laughs> quest to, uh, to build up uh, the full ocean collection. But the company itself never kept archive copies of the, of the games, which is sad. But sad, I didn't either. Yes, sir. Hi, Gary. I was just wondering, Hello. how old was your youngest software engineer? I, um, I would say there was a guy um, we, who was actually working at college called Nick Sheard. Mark, can you help me out with this? Nick Sheard, um, yeah. he used to work with us in the school holidays, didn't he? Yeah, what and did he, he do? And he was a genius. PC games, did he do? PC games. And, is that you? No. Oh, David. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you? 16. Oh. There you go. Okay, there was this guy called David Blake, he was bloody useless. <laughs> Remember him well. <laughs> no, of course, and yourself, yeah. Oh, that was a very leading question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you fell into a trap there, Gary. Yeah, I know. Okay, any more can be traps. <laughs> any final questions for Gary? I'll be sorry, I'll shout it. Oh, not you. <laughs> She's a lawyer, watch what you say. <laughs> Did you ever get a bit part in a movie? Yes. Look <laughs> at all these plants throughout the audience. This is the leading questions. Um, he did, uh, yeah, he did uh, the movie of Nightbreed. Um, and got very friendly with uh, Clive Barker, uh, who wrote the books and directed the film. And we were on set, I was on set an awful lot in Pinewood Studios. And uh, one day he said, would you like to be in the film? And I went, nah, of course, like, yes. And I spent four hours in makeup being made up as a creature, which I've still got photos of. Um, but six hours getting the prosthetics removed. Um, so I did that for two days, but uh, that was a, an amazing experience. Shame the game and the film was so crap. But, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for reminding me, Sally. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any more plants? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> As you mentioned that uh, you read all the movie scripts. So I imagine when you were reading them, you had a, an idea in your head of how the game would play or how, how it would turn out. Um, how much say did you have on what the game played like, and was there any that were drastically different from how you imagined it when it was reading the script? It's, it's, it's a good question. I think um, I took more of a high-level view and, and, and identified not so much the entire movie, but scenes that could be transferred, translated to, to uh, a video game scenario. Uh, and then once I was satisfied, and Untouchables is a good example, once I was satisfied that there, were, there was enough meat in the movie to be able to, to, to create a game from, then uh, no, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd be in the design meetings, we'd brainstorm, um, but I, you know, I might have contributed one or two bad ideas, but um, uh, by and large, uh, I let the creative people take charge of, of that process. Um, but obviously I had input and uh, uh, they, were, they were great meetings. Thank you. The first time I met you was I was 16 and I used to work at a computer game shop and you worked for Ocean and you took us out, yeah, as Ocean took us out. And I remember, I must have been drunk, 16, 17, no, it's not like that. I was young and naive and needed the money. Um, no, but I remember you, you, you spoke to all of me with massive respect. The next time I bumped into you was in 1999 at Cannes at some, some um, computer game shop. And once again, you treated me with respect and I was just a lonely staff writer at the time. Where did this culture... Like, I mean, I said to my wife, genuinely, that I, I, you had an impact on me about the way that I, I, I deal with people, is that I had nothing to offer you as a, as a, as a computer gamer back in the day, but yet you treated me with respect. And I, I, I swear, prior to this, I said to the wife, I've seen you speaking here, that you had an impact on me, just the way that you deal with people. Where has that come from? Has that always been prevalent with you? I mean, just this, this culture of just, just treating people with respect. And it's true, it's not, it's not bullshit, yeah, this is absolutely true. Well, thank you. Um, I'll treat you like shit from now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I appreciate you saying that. I, I, I like to think I've gone through a life treating people as I'd like to be treated myself. And it's as simple as that, genuinely. And that's the way it should be, I think. Any more questions? Okay, well, I think that was a good point to leave it on, Gary. <laughs> thank you so much. Well Very wonderful.
We do have uh, some more amazing interviews coming up this afternoon. Uh, David Pleasance, the former Managing Director of Commodore UK, is going to be joining us.